What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Fireside Giants. I'm your host, Anthony Rivardo, joined by my co-host, Alex Wilson, and happy Victory Monday, the New York Giants, securing the dub against the New England Patriots yesterday afternoon. Tommy DeVito with another great performance. Wink Martindale's defensive unit with a stellar three-turnover-forcing performance against the Patriots. The Giants now have four wins on the season, fell a little bit in the draft stock, but... They still have a lot of hope for the future, and Joe Shane addressed the media today for the first time during this regular season. Of course, with the Giants entering their bye week, you had Brian Dable speak to the reporters, and of course, you had Joe Shane speak to the reporters, and he definitely shared some insight on what the Giants' future um, plans are at the position, especially for the quarterback, right? Because when he was talking about Daniel Jones, was he definitive that Daniel Jones is the future of this team? Some of you may interpret it that he was, in my opinion, I think that he left the door wide open for a quarterback to replace Daniel Jones in the upcoming offseason. So we're going to go ahead and dive into Joe Shane's press conference, some of the quotes from it, some of the takeaways, not just about Daniel Jones on the quarterback position as well. He did have some really interesting quotes about Evan Neal and a few other key players and positions for the Giants. But of course, we do want to dive primarily into some of his comments on the quarterback position. But before we dive into all this, make sure to leave a like if you do enjoy this episode, subscribe to the channel if you are new ring the bell so you don't miss an episode and comment your thoughts on the topic down below in the comment section if you listen on apple or spotify please make sure to leave us a five-star review and go ahead and follow us on all of our social media channels at fireside giants but without further ado alex how are you doing today my friend and what are your thoughts on joe shane's comments at his bi-week presser well i'm doing pretty good and joe shane's comments were about as exactly what we anticipated you know he was a little vague on some things but he was pretty straightforward and gave us the answers that we expected and Let's get one thing out of the way, guys. You know, Joe Shane came out and said, we expect Daniel Jones to be the starting quarterback when he is healthy. Um, now, let's actually look at this this kind of statement here. Let's break this statement down. Um, as Anthony, you know, discussed with me just before we started this, we were kind of talking about it, and he said, you know, expect, you expect somebody to do something. You expect somebody to be the starter. Does it mean you guarantee? Does it mean it's actually going to happen? You expect them to um, do this whatever thing it is. And they expect Daniel Jones to get healthy and obviously perform um, at a high, at a $47 million level. But here's the thing. Here's the caveat in this entire equation is that Daniel Jones is not going anywhere for Joe Shane to come out and say anything, but decent to good things about Daniel Jones would be out of proportion simply because he is owed $47.1 million next year. There's no way out of that contract. There's no way out of it. He is on this team. So Instilling faith in him, instilling a little bit of confidence that he can come back and be the starter, it was the only thing Joe Shane could do. It's the only way to get around this, but at the same time, we also discussed the idea of drafting a quarterback, adding somebody in free agency, the idea they will take the best op option on the market or the best option on the board. There's a lot of doors that are open right now. The Giants are not going to give away their draft strategy in late November in a season where they're 4-8 and eight and clearly headed toward um, a missed playoff appearance. So I'll tell you this right now. Um, did he commit to Daniel Jones? He said he expects him to be the starting uh, quarterback when he's healthy. Doesn't say I guarantee. So we'll see how this unfolds. So, you know, we might be just nitpicking something that he meant to say something else. Um, but it, it's pretty obvious to me, at least, that the Giants are not moving on from Daniel Jones. Why? Because they can't. They cannot move on from Daniel Jones in 2024. It's impossible. He is on this team. However, one key element, Anthony, that I want to kind of pass on to you here is that Joe Shane did say that they may need a quarterback to come and help win some games at the beginning of the 2024 season. Who is that going to be? Probably not going to be Tyrod Taylor. Is it going to be Tommy DeVito or is it going to be a rookie quarterback? And a lot of people would argue that a rookie quarterback stepping in to help play some games at the beginning of next season would not only be good for his development, but also apply pressure to Daniel Jones to come back and perform. And maybe you get some really good value out of your quarterback position. Maybe you, maybe if Daniel Jones wins that job because he has something to lose, that rookie quarterback can sit and learn for a season and then take over naturally after that out in the contract. Or the quarterback you know, steps in immediately and plays well and takes that starting job, and Daniel Jones ends up backing him up while they commit to this young player. Like, and at the end of the day, Daniel Jones walks home with $47 million in his pocket, if not way more than that because of the guaranteed money over the long term. Um, he still wins at the end of the day. He still wins because he gets a bag and no matter what. So, Anthony, what are your thoughts about the fact that, you know, Joe Shane did open up the idea that another quarterback may have to play a couple of weeks next season? Are you thinking about how that plays into our draft strategy? Because I certainly am, and I think most people are thinking the same thing. 
Yeah, I think that definitely plays into the Giants draft strategy. I mean, listen, Daniel Jones has had a number of injuries throughout his career. He had a neck injury this season that kept him sidelined for three weeks. He comes back into the lineup. He immediately tears his ACL. He's done for the year. And now when you're looking at Daniel Jones and Joe Shane discussed this at length uh, during his presser, we don't know when he's going to be healthy. Some players are ready to go by training camp, and that's something that Shane again mentioned. Some players aren't ready until the next season, maybe deep within the next season, and that's a possibility. Now, Daniel Jones, as Shane discussed, is already getting to work. He was in the facility yesterday, was walking without his crutches. Joe Shane had to remind him to use his crutches and not just walk with them in his hands. That's the kind of guy that Daniel Jones is. He's a hard worker. He's fighting like hell to get back from this injury as soon as possible. So it's possible that he is ready to go in training camp and he is ready to be the starter week one. And of course, the expectation would be once he's healthy, he's the starter. But that doesn't mean that the Giants aren't going to look at potential replacements or potential succession plans for Daniel Jones here. He didn't rule out anything like that because what he said was this team needs to add quarterback talent because they don't have the depth there with Tyrod Taylor on an expiring contract. And then when he was asked about would Daniel Jones prevent you from taking a quarterback in the first round, Joe Shane, Joe Shane did not say that that was the case. In fact, he said that he will take the best player available, heavily insinuating that if that best player available is a quarterback, that will be the draft selection. And that was the most eye-opening part of this entire press conference for me because we have seen general managers in the past, whether you're talking about Dave Gettleman and the New York Giants or you're talking about across the league, Ryan Poles for the Chicago Bears being a recent example, we have seen general managers be asked that question is this quarterback your franchise quarterback? Will they prevent you from taking a quarterback in the first round? And when they really feel like that's their franchise quarterback, they will say, we will not take a quarterback to replace Daniel Jones. He is our definitive starter. Joe Shane didn't say that. He refused to name Daniel Jones as the future of this franchise. He mentioned the injuries. He said, yes, they still have confidence in him. Look at what he did last season, won a road playoff game. They need to build the roster around the quarterback because that's a team sport. These are all things that Joe Shane said, and they are all true. However, he also did not say certain things. He did not say that they have the utmost confidence in Daniel Jones and that they still you know, think that the contract was the right decision and that they're confident he'll play out the entire contract. There were certain things that Joe Shane could have said and chose not to. He actively chose not to say certain things, and he actively chose to say other things, like they would consider drafting a quarterback in the first round. Now, as I mentioned, Tyrod Taylor on an expiring contract, Daniel Jones on injured reserve. The only quarterback that they have under contract next season is Tommy DeVito. Tommy DeVito should be back with this team as a backup quarterback, but Tommy DeVito does not prevent them from drafting a quarterback, whether that be in the first round, the seventh round, or anything in between, or going out and grabbing a veteran quarterback in free agency. The point that you make, the Giants might be without Daniel Jones for the first month or so of the season. That's a great point to make because if that is the case, they do need someone to step in there and try and win games. Why Brian Dable really needs someone to step in there and win games. This hasn't been the season that we expected for the New York Giants. Brian Dable, I think that Pretty confidently, I can say he's going to be the head coach next season, but if he continues to lose going into next season, that's when his seat starts to get warm. So how does Brian Dable find himself in a winning position next season? By having a quarterback that can win games and not put up only seven points per game, put up some real touchdowns, some real points on the board. If the New York Giants get a good quarterback in there who can do that, whether they think that's Daniel Jones or a rookie, that's how they will win games. So there is an incentive here for Daniel Jones, or I mean, not Daniel Jones, for Brian Dable, for Joe Shane to go ahead and get a quarterback capable of winning games in the early portion of the season. So that could be one of those stopgap players, you know, like a Josh Dobbs wins you four games in the beginning of the season and then Daniel Jones comes back in. That's totally possible if they go that route. However, they could go the route of taking a first round quarterback. You swing for the fences. If they start off their season with a lot of success, you know, as a rookie steps in there, starts bringing excitement to the team, winning football games. They might not even lose that starting job when Daniel Jones is ready to play. So again, the the term there where he said the expectation is that Daniel Jones will be the starter. He did not say that it's a guarantee that Daniel Jones will be a starter. Um, You know, when he's healthy, he expects it. However, there are so many things that could subvert those expectations. If the Giants were to draft a quarterback and the quarterback is playing really well and then Daniel Jones is healthy, well, your expectations were not met. He's no longer the starter. So I think that Joe Shane left the door wide open on taking a quarterback. There were a lot of things that he said, a lot of things that he didn't say. And realistically, 
that quote right there where he said, we will take the best player available when asked about drafting a quarterback, that was the most eye-opening moment in the entire press conference because that was Joe Shane pretty much giving himself an out, right? Like that quote is the one that we will attach to and that reporters will attach to and that if the Giants do draft a quarterback all the way up in April, that quote is the one that's going to stand out. The one where he said, we'll take the best player on the board regardless of their position. We won't take a quarterback off the board. That was definitely the most important quote of the day from Joe Shane, in my opinion. And it's one that in six months from now, we might look back on and be like, damn, he was telling us that they were drafting a quarterback or he might be He might not even be planning on taking a quarterback. I don't know. I think my main takeaway, though, is Joe Shane hasn't made a decision at the quarterback position. And that means that he has not decided that Daniel Jones is still the franchise quarterback. He hasn't decided that he's drafting a quarterback, but he also hasn't decided that Daniel Jones is the future of the franchise. So it'll be a really interesting final five weeks here as, you know, the the coaching staff and the scouting staff goes to certain bowl games or certain um, shrine games and all that stuff coming up here. The senior bowl coming up as well. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how the Giants scouting staff finishes this upcoming college season and these bowl games, but it's going to be one really, really interesting off season. So Alex, how are you feeling about some of those takeaways that I had from the press conference? I imagine you're feeling the same way. Do you think that this is a situation where Joe Shane is totally leaving the door open for a franchise quarterback to be drafted in the first round? Or do you think, do you interpret his, uh, his statements more as, they're going to look for a guy who can win them some games towards the beginning of the season as they ease Daniel Jones back into the lineup. Well, I'll say this, you know, Joe Shane and Brian Dable have one more year. It's next year, right? The Giants don't want to go. I don't think John Mara wants to go ahead and fire another coach and general manager after a two year cycle. I think he wants to give them time. And I think that Brian Dable probably has one more year. And, and here's the reality. I don't think that Joe Shane can fire Brian Dable. You know, if you heard how he spoke about the Leonard Williams situation, he almost seemed choked up about it. I don't think there's a world where if Brian Dable is fired, Joe Shane survives. Um, I think they are a duo. They are a pair. If one goes, the other is going too. So I kind of feel as though right now they have one more year to get this thing in the right direction. And guys, in their best – and I know that they're talking about the best interest of the of the organization – but the best interest of them is to draft a quarterback. And I think that, that in my opinion, is objectively true, right? I think that is objectively true, that the best interest in their jobs, in their you know long-term futures with this organization um, is drafting a quarterback. And it's it's building in competition. Look, Joe Shane, and, and you said it, right? Joe Shane said, we're going to take the best position available, no matter what position it is, no matter what it is. You know what I mean? And guys, quarterbacks oftentimes rank as the highest players on draft boards. So... If the Giants are sitting at six or five and Jaden Daniels is sitting there and he's coming off a Heisman winning season and he took such a big statistical de- uh, statistical leap, um, I actually just learned another really interesting stat. And Anthony, I think you're going to appreciate this one a lot. Um, Jaden Daniels was in the 79th percentile in percentage of self-created pressures. So it means most of the pressures against him, most of the pressure on him from the LSU offensive line was not his fault. Um, if you look at a lot, and I know you have said this before, a lot of the pressure that Daniel Jones and some and, and Tyra Taylor, a lot of the pressure that was created was their fault because they held onto the ball too long. They didn't get rid of it. They didn't navigate the pocket uh, properly. Jaden Jan- Daniels specifically, I'm just talking about him right now because now we're in that range of, of him unless you trade up. He is a player who navigates the pocket exceptionally well. He has that elite running ability. And he can throw the football. And you can tell me right now, if the Giants are sitting at five, he isn't the best player on the board coming off a Heisman caliber season where he took statistical leaps that are almost uncomprehendable. I mean, he's going to be the best player on the board if he's there at six or five, wherever we end up. So, um, you know, if, if that's the case, Joe Shane just said it. He's going to take the best player available, and that could be a quarterback. And having Jaden Daniels start the first two, three games of the season, is anyone really going to tell me right now that's a bad thing? Is anyone really going to tell me right now that they wouldn't, they don't want to take a chance on a quarterback with elite upside that could change the course of this organization forever? I mean, guys, imagine the Eagles without Jalen Hurts. Imagine, um, you know, the the Chiefs without Patrick Mahomes. Imagine the Bills without Josh Allen. I mean, the Bills are struggling right now with Josh Allen, but it's certainly not his fault. It's it's everybody else's fault too. It's a team sport, but a quarterback makes it go. A quarterback is what wins championships. You watch Patrick Mahomes with basically one ankle last year beat the Eagles in the Super Bowl. You think he does? You think anyone else is stepping in there and doing that? I don't think so, guys. 
you have to have an elite quarterback to be a, a, an elite team these days. You can't do it with a quarterback that needs everything to be right around them. And I'm not saying just about Daniel Jones. This could be anybody in the NFL. This could be, you know, Tua. It could be whatever. If things aren't great for elite quarterbacks, if you have a good quarterback, things need to be good around them for them to be great. Um, you, you know, Patrick Mahomes makes everybody better. Jalen Hurts makes everybody better. CJ Stroud, and not, that's not to say that obviously the Eagles have an elite offensive line and elite receivers. That certainly helps. But look at, you know, CJ Stroud, for example. He's making everybody better, and he doesn't have elite uh, players around him. He has a terrible offensive line and some good playmakers, but just really good coaching and good confidence. He's a, he's a really high IQ uh, quarterback. And the Giants, if they get someone like that, imagine what it does for you. Imagine what it does in the New York market. Imagine having a winner, a guy that wins in big games, shows up against big opponents. Imagine competing against Dallas and not getting blown the hell out every single game. Imagine competing against the Eagles, guys. When's the last time that we've competed against those teams when they had their starting quarterback in? We literally had to have Dak Prescott out of the game for us to even have a chance at beating Dallas. I mean, what are we doing here? You know what I mean? What are we doing here in terms of we're not able to beat good teams? The Minnesota Vikings had one of the worst defenses in history last season. That's why we won that game. And Daniel Jones played exceptionally well. But you got to do it against great teams. How many big games has Daniel Jones won? How many big games have has the has the offense showed up? And not just Daniel Jones, but the offensive line. They get the absolute shit kicked out of them against good teams. We just beat the lowly pa- uh, Pittsburgh, uh, you know, Patriots, New England Patriots, and the lowly Washington Commanders. Is that something to be happy about? Like, we can't beat competitive teams. We need superstar-level players. We need to take shots at players with that level of upside. And that's the only way we're going to get back to a level of competency where we can actually play great football and have a chance at beating divisional opponents in our own in our own turf, man. We can't even be, even be competitive in our own freaking field, let alone in the Lincoln Center or in Arlington. Like, save me the freaking sob stories of Daniel Jones can do it. I haven't seen him go in there and beat the Eagles. I don't think I don't remember the last time we beat the Eagles, guys. Do you? I can't recall. The last time we beat Dallas, they didn't even have Dak Prescott. Like, come on, what are we doing here? We're we're we're, we're settling for mediocrity. And, and and this is not just about Daniel Jones. This is about the offensive line. This is about the coaching. This is about a lot of things. Um, but the truth is, like, you need an elite quarterback to be an elite team. You need an elite quarterback to win championships, and we don't have that right now, objectively. Um, so I, I do feel as though, you know, I and we wish that Daniel Jones panned out. And from what Joe Shane is saying, the doors are open, man. They're going to take the best player available. They're going to do whatever it needs to be done to, you know, move on and, and, and hopefully make this team very good in the future. And drafting quarterback is in their best interest. It's in the team's best interest. And it's in the long-term future of the organization's best interest. Because, guys, I mean, tell me right now, in the comments right now, who wants to pay Daniel Jones $56 million in 2026? Raise your hand. Do you want to pay Daniel Jones fifty-six million dollars in two thousand twenty-six, Anthony? Do you think that's do you think that's a successful way to to build this team where you could use that money, that margin between fifty-six million and ten million for a rookie quarterback? That margin there, that's four Bobby O'Karakays, guys, four freaking Bobby O'Karakays. Okay, what do you want me to say? Like, I'm not paying Daniel Jones fifty-six million dollars, and if you're not paying him in two thousand twenty-six, why the hell would you pay him in two thousand twenty-five? Huh? What's the point? You know, you may as well reset the rookie window now. So I feel as though. You know, that time, if you're going to move on from DJ anyway and not pay him that money, that time, that three years is better off spent developing a quarterback with elite upside. That's my rational take. That's my logical take. That's how I feel. That's my opinion. Of course, you're allowed to disagree with me, and I and I, and I know a lot of you guys will, and I respect the hell out of you anyway, because at the end of the day, we're all trying to figure out ways for the Giants to be a competent football team that doesn't make us freaking depressed on most Sundays. Well, that would be the dream is if we could go into Sundays feeling confident in our team to pick up wins against good teams. Of course, I know there's many different solutions to that. As you said, drafting a superstar quarterback, I mean, easier said than done, but drafting a quarterback who can win those big games, that's the key to winning those big games, but also it is a team sport. Um, Like you mentioned, Josh Allen's a really good example. He had a superstar performance last night. He was incredible, Um, but still the Buffalo Bills lost to the Eagles because the team around him kind of failed him in some ways. Um, and that's been the case for many quarterbacks throughout the years, throughout the season, especially, um, we've seen great quarterbacks be, or fall victim really to a lack of competent players and coaches around them. Um, and you could argue that that's what's happened to Daniel Jones, but also there's an argument to be made that Daniel Jones doesn't elevate his game to the proper level and doesn't make the plays necessary to win those big games. Um, minus that one game against Minnesota, which is still one of my favorite 
football moments of the past, you know, seven years was watching Daniel Jones win that game. So like I said, it's going to be an interesting offseason. Joe Shane definitely left the door open for the Giants to take a quarterback. He didn't say whether or not they would do it. They didn't he didn't say whether or not they were in the market for a first round quarterback. We'll get a lot more info on this kind of stuff once we get to those bowl games, those shrine games. You know, when when we get to that senior bowl, Joe Shane will be there. He'll talk to reporters um, and there will be reporters there watching Joe Shane's behavior and who he's watching, who he's scouting. And because if you guys didn't know, the Senior Bowl was expanded this year. It's not just seniors who are going to be at the Senior Bowl. There will be juniors. They expanded it to really like all draft prospects. So you're going to see guys like Drake May probably competing at the Senior Bowl this year and practicing this year. And you'll get news about the Giants were interviewing this player. They were talking to this player extensively, scouting this player extensively. So when we get to that senior bowl, that's a time to keep a really close eye on the news because we'll see, oh, Joe Shane was heavily scouting Caleb Williams, Drake May, all these other players. And it'll only ramp up from there into the combine in March. And then, of course, we get all the way to the draft in April. There's going to be a lot of news coming out. We'll get more of an idea of what the Giants are planning as the next couple of months kind of move on here. But right now, I don't think Joe Shane knows what he's planning on doing in the draft. I don't think the Giants have any idea. I think right now they're they're probably excited to see Tommy DeVito succeeding because so they can feel a little bit comfortable with him as their backup quarterback. Um, and they're going to continue evaluating some of the other talents on the roster so they know where they want to go and what direction they want to go in free agency and the draft. I will say, though, Alex, when we get to free agency in March, if the Giants do Don't sign a quarterback, the one that's like a competent player that can win them games early in the season. If they don't make that move in March, that indicates that they're taking a quarterback in April, in my opinion, because otherwise they will get somebody that's going to win them games in the season in March to be confident that they can win some games with a backup unless they decide, you know, Tommy DeVito is that guy, but we'll see. He said that they have to add somebody to their roster. So if we don't see them add a quarterback to the roster in March, again, I think that you can see that happening in April. I think that would be a pretty clear indicator. But I do want to talk about some of these other points that Joe Shane made during his press conference before we wrap up here, Alex. The main one that I really want to dive into real quickly here is Evan Neal. So he was asked about Evan Neal, was asked about would he possibly make the move to guard? Joe Shane kind of shot that down pretty quickly. He said, you know, I looked at his Alabama tape again. I looked at how he was playing offensive tackle at Alabama. He's an offensive tackle, but he needs to play better. And I really liked that quote from Joe Shane because it wasn't like, oh, he's caught bad break with injuries, blah, blah, blah. No, he said Evan Neal needs to play better. And he said that flat out. And that was what I wanted to hear from Joe Shane. Joe Shane's always been very honest in these press conferences since he's gotten here as the general manager of the Giants. He doesn't lie. He doesn't do a whole lot of misleading. He's very blunt about certain things. So I appreciated that he continued that when talking about Evan Neal, said that he needs to be better. Kind of indicated that, you know, it's up to the coaching staff what they do with him, really. But he doesn't expect him to make the move over to guard. But I do like that he's just being blunt about it, like Evan Neal needs to be a better football player. And we all know that that's 100% true. So kind of how are you feeling, Alex, when you hear Joe Shane kind of quickly shoot down the idea of moving Evan Neal to guard? How do you feel about that? Because I know that you've been kind of a big proponent in recent weeks about the idea of moving Evan Neal to guard. But also, how do you feel about the fact that he's just like, damn, Evan Neal needs to play better football? And and to me, it kind of indicated that if he doesn't start to play better football, once we get into this offseason, this roster evaluation, there could be a replacement on the way. I mean, look, anyone with half a brain could could see that Evan Neal has struggled. And at this point, I'm actually headed toward labeling him injury prone based on the fact that he's had an MCL sprain last year and two ankle injuries this season and missed a quite significant amount of time. So he's headed in that direction of it being injury prone, which is problematic because, you know, he's your starting right tackle conceivably. And, you know, the fact that Joe Shane is being honest and saying that he needs to step up and be better. I mean, I think that Evan Neal knows he needs to step up and be better because ultimately he's going to lose his job at right tackle if he doesn't. However, that doesn't mean the Giants should not be adding competition to a position of weakness. Like, can we can we please, for the love of God, like stop trying our best to like, you know, commit to players who are downward trending like Evan Neal had a couple of good games, but like he hasn't shown enough for me to be like, yeah, he's our starter next year or we should give him another chance. They need to have competition at right tackle. That could be a second round pick uh, offensive tackle for what it's worth. That could be a veteran offensive tackle. Like, I don't know, like a George fan from the Jets. I don't know. It could be anybody, someone that's cheaper 
or, or even middle uh, middle price. Look, the Giants defense is balling out without Leonard Williams. That was a $32 million cap hit. We now know the Giants don't need Leonard Williams to be a good defense. We can take that money, roll it over into an offensive lineman, and get someone of decent value. Get someone that can come in and compete with Evan Neal and at least be an average starter. All the Giants need is average, man. We haven't had average in a decade. And like that's really all it takes for us to get better quarterback play, better offensive production, average offensive line play. Um, of course, you aim for much higher than that. But the Giants should absolutely 150% be going out and spending a little bit of money to go out and get, even if it's a one-year deal or a two-year deal, um, an offensive tackle who can compete with Evan Neal. And then during camp, during training camp, during offseason, Evan Neal should be working on his guard uh, fundamentals. He should be working on potentially transitioning to guard and learning the position because if they do not do the due diligence of having him practice at guard as well and he doesn't pan out, which is trending in that direction, if not already there, we're going to be sitting here like, why the hell did we not prepare for the worst case scenario when it was so obvious that the worst case scenario was staring us in the face? This is the problem with the Giants sometimes. They do not want to acknowledge the fact that players are not living up to what they should be and they do not take the proper precautions. You know, example, Eric Flowers, now we're seeing it at Vanille, literally like, it's almost a freaking like replica of that entire situation. We refuse to move him to a position we knew he'd be better at. Let's not make the same mistake twice, guys. Let's not do the dumb things. Let's make the uh, let's do the precautions. Make sure we take care of a situation that could end up becoming a we can get a positive out of what is a massive negative right now. And that's ultimately how I feel about Evan Neal. They need to go and bring in somebody to help compete, but they also need to start working Neal into guard and, and at least just getting him prepared for that eventual reality that he could have to change positions. And at the very least, the Giants will have him for three more years. And, the, and maybe he turns into a great offensive guard and the Giants have right guard figured out for a, a long time. Like, like would not be a good scenario. Like we just, but you just never know unless you try. And I feel like right now the Giants aren't even trying. Um, so we'll see though. We'll see. I think they wanted to give him this season. I think that was fair. I think that's justified, but this off season, I'm a hundred percent getting him ready to potentially make that transition because, um, you know, two years of poor performance, you know, what else can you really do with that? You, you can't keep, you know, what was I say? The definition of crazy is doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for a different result. We can't be crazy about this. 100% agree. And I'd like to see the giants go in a new direction in terms of fortifying that offensive line. Um, when Joe Shane was asked about that, actually, I thought that was an interesting response that he had. Um, he was asked, how could you have better built this offensive line in the offseason to prepare for the season? Like, what? where do you think your roster construction went wrong? And he kind of just said, Andrew Thomas getting injured was what went wrong. And I, I do wish Joe Shane would have said a little bit more in terms of, we could have added more depth here, more depth there. But at the same time, I get why he wouldn't say something like that. He doesn't want to make it sound like he just brought in a bunch of crappy offensive linemen, doesn't want to kill the confidence of some of those players, you know, that he brought in and told like, hey, I want you to be here. So I, I get it. But at the same time, I think Joe Shane probably knows in the back of his head, I need to do a little bit better job of finding some offensive line talent this offseason. And I think that was pretty clearly indicated by him saying Evan Neal needs to be better. I think that was almost like a warning shot to Evan Neal in some ways. Like, hey, you got to be better. Otherwise... We might be looking for your replacement. I think that's one of the things that you could take away from that moment there from Joe Shane. Um, but overall, it was a pretty eventful presser just based on the quarterback situation. Um, again, the Evan Neal takeaway. Uh, last thing that I think we could dive into, Alex, before we wrap up here is the Saquon Barkley points that uh, Joe Shane made. He said that that's a player they never were considering trading. It's not a player that they had any idea in the back of their mind. They didn't take calls. They didn't make calls. They didn't plan on trading Saquon Barkley, despite the whole uh, Leonard Williams trade. That indicated that this team was looking for some sort of a rebuild situation with future draft picks. They didn't make the same decision with Saquon Barkley. They chose to keep him. He mentioned, you know, Saquon's productivity um, or production levels, rather, and how he's been really keeping the offense afloat at times and how special of a talent he is. So it sounds like Joe Shane's still interested in bringing back Saquon Barkley long term I wonder if you're feeling this way Alex I, it almost sounded to me like this was the prelude or the precursor to Shane maybe bringing up extension talks in the offseason with Barkley again and trying to sign him long term wondering how you feel about the the things that Shane said about Saquon Barkley whether or not you think it was the right decision to hold on to him at the trade deadline and whether or not you think that this is that precursor to him eventually going ahead and signing him to a long-term extension uh, you know what, Saquon Barkley, uh, you know, I, I see so many, the thing, I'm really conflicted about Saquon because I freaking love the guy. He is such a good dude. He is such a great community member. He represents, and, and here's here's maybe a hot take, maybe not so hot take. 
I think Saquon's the face of the organization, not Daniel Jones. Um, I think that you see Saquon, they always publicize his community uh, things. I don't really ever see Daniel Jones doing all that stuff. He's kind of just quiet, does his thing, works hard. And I respect that from Daniel. It's a great work ethic. But Saquon's the one that gets all the attention for his public, you know, you know, affection and what he does to give back to the community. And Jordan Runon of ESPN just reported, I think, before the just before this press conference this morning that Saquon Barkley meets with six like underprivileged kids after every game. And for God's sake, like <laughs> no wonder the Giants keep this guy around. The guy is just a great human being and they feel like they owe him because he makes them look really freaking good. Like in the face of adversity, when the Giants are sucking, everything is going down the shitter. Saquon Barkley is doing phenomenal things for the community and actually playing his heart out. And I think he ranks in some of the top categories among running backs this year. So it's like, you know, while I while I do not suggest extending running backs based on the legitimate fact that like they're injury prone and things happen and you know this and that, I'm okay with actually offering Saquon Barkley another franchise tag at 12 million because look, the reality is if you go out and draft a young quarterback, a rookie quarterback, Saquon Barkley's a leader, man. Look what he's helping do for, for Tommy DeVito in terms of encouraging him, giving him that confidence. Imagine what he could do for a rookie a rookie quarterback, a guy that's like actually has that level of elite upside, like a Jaden Daniels or a Caleb or this or that. Saquon is that veteran kind of mentality that just like ushers them into this, to this uh, new realm of the NFL where everything is so much different. The pace, the physicality, the preparation, uh, the discipline. Saquon is a great example for that. And I think that value, you can't really put a price on it sometimes. Um, so at this point in time, look, I think if he walks away, and, and this is the truth, if Saquon Barkley got a three-year extension, um, let's say with $25 million, or let's say $22, $23 million guaranteed, um, that's essentially what he's going to get. You know what I mean? Except he got two years and $22 million fully guaranteed. At the end of the day, that he actually walks away better off with those two uh, franchise tags because the, the contract's fully guaranteed then a long-term extension because because he gets the guaranteed money and then he can leverage that into another um, deal because the Giants could have just caught him after two years and he may get even less guaranteed money than that. So, you know, I, I feel as though he actually benefits from this equation um, of going back-to-back -back franchise tags. And I think the Giants probably told him they didn't even listen to trade calls on him, dude. They didn't even listen to anyone that wanted Saquon Barkley to the deadline. They are bringing Saquon back. And it's going to be on the tag. And they probably promised him that when he signed it originally. We're going to, he's like, you know, they probably like, look, we really, we're going to tag you again. We're going to get you your money, but we just don't want to go in the third year because, you know, we don't have the money. We want to see how this quarterback situation unfolds. You know, there's other things that may have been pressuring them in the meantime. Um, but I do believe that they're going to tag him again. And I'm I'm actually 100% fine with that because a rookie quarterback with a guy like Saquon alongside him, it just makes him better. And it allows them to take pressure off of the rookie quarterback to step up and do all the work. And look, Eric Gray is not Saquon Barkley. Gary Brightwell is not Saquon Barkley. Matt Breda sure as hell isn't Saquon Barkley. So, you know, for what he does in the, for the organization off the field, on the field, he's just an important. And in the locker room, he's an essential piece. They just traded away one of their captains in Leonard Williams, one of their biggest voices in locker room glues. They cannot let Saquon Barkley go this offseason because if they do, I'm afraid that locker room will actually fall apart if they hit any sort of adversity. Yeah, I mean, I think you make some great points there. Listen, Saquon Barkley, I agree with you. I think he is the face of the New York Giants franchise right now. I think that he'll continue to be as long as they keep him around. And I do think they will keep him around. I think he's super important to the locker room. That's one of the things Joe Shane mentioned when he was talking about the Leonard Williams trade. He was like, listen, there is a trickle down effect here. Like there is a ripple effect in the locker room. Like this is something, this was a deal that we were a little nervous about making. You know, there is something to be said about trading players and how that affects the rest of the team. And I think that when he was saying that about Leonard Williams, he was really also saying that about Saquon Barkley. And so I do think there's a lot of truth and a lot of weight to that where Saquon Barkley remaining on this team is not just important to a lot of fans. It's important to a lot of people inside the organization from coaches, from, you know, staff members of the team and of course his teammates. So I do think Saquon Barkley returns next season. It'll be it'll be interesting though. I, I think that, you know, there's probably gonna be some sort of a market generated if he does get the franchise tag once again. But honestly, I feel more confident than I did going into last offseason that the New York Giants would be looking to extend Saquon Barkley long term. So we'll see what happens. Of course, like I mentioned, it's going to be one interesting offseason. There's going to be a lot going on between now and the draft, between now and free agency, of course. So many months to go, but with like a month or so remaining in the regular season, we kind of know where the Giants stand. They should end up with a top 10 pick. 
They should be considering a quarterback with that top 10 pick, and they should also be making a lot of moves in free agency to fortify the roster around whoever the quarterback is. We know that that's going to be a massive point of emphasis for our New York Giants. But of course, we'll update you on anything else that we hear about Joe Shane, about Daniel Jones, about the quarterback position, everything else in between right here on Fireside Giants. So Make sure to leave a like if you did enjoy this episode. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Ring the bell so you don't miss an episode and comment your thoughts on the topics down below in the comment section. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please make sure to leave us a five-star review. And go ahead and follow us on all of our social media channels at Fireside Giants. But without further ado, we will catch you all in the next one. Have a good one, and let's go Giants.